Hello everyone, today we talk about the calm before the second crisis of 1397-99 of Richard II's reign. Uh, it's the first time we talk about him specifically, so this was a phase of, of his rule that fundamentally had seen the consolidation of power after an initial crisis in 1386-88, being triggered by, you know, French policy because uh, the kingdom was to, to go out war at least was threatened and would essentially require taxes the, the parliament um, essentially um, went against the king uh, we had already had by the way in the past to face in his youth the uh, rebellion of what Tyler and John uh, bald and um, and his mm, you know the, the second crisis that we will see another time um, would bring actually to the king's uh, end and this first crisis had been resolved in favor of the parliament essentially the king had to, to have been uh, his uh, armies and, th and, and servants defeated in battle so that that also brought him to essentially compel the parliament's will to put to death also some of his favorites for example uh, and uh, in in the following eight years, he mm, you know he resumed power relatively quickly by 1389, and he came by saying essentially in front of the parliament had been misled, misjudged. He was you know, he was fairly young at the time, and in the following eight years, so before the second crisis, he actually managed to reconsolidate um, great part of the, 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 the power lost and you know increase actually it um, through stressing essentially uh, the, the royal prerogatives of which he was he was very uh, firmly a very firm believer achieving other successes such such as the expedition in Ireland um, and having a broader policy of appeasement with with, with, with France mm -hmm. and Richard is a is a fascinating figure because it mostly was shaped in uh, you know posthumous reputation by William Shakespeare in, in the uh, homonymous play of Richard II in fact um, as a you know misruler fundamentally that um, would even you know trigger on the long run the Wars of the Roses um, today we don't think that of course of him but at the same time the second phase um, of his his rule was surely marked by um, an increase uh, in uh, you know in uh, in authority um, over the parliament, but especially um, by certain mistakes that eventually would trigger to the second crisis his deposal and eventual death by you know the year after in four, uh, 1400. Um, fascinating figure also for the uh, dynastic problems involved here. He was, but you know, this crisis started, you know, when he, he was childless. He was the son of nonetheless the, the, the Black Prince, hmm? and um, the uh, you know his mm, reign was also you know had uh, influenced by the presence of John of Gaunt, who was the, his uncle, uh, son, one of the sons of Edward the Third. Um, and Wu's son, Henry, uh, the, the future, uh, I mean, Henry Bolingbroke, the future Henry IV, um, was also this uh, key figure and that would re lead to the eventual revolt because he, he, he had this great prestige of royal lineage, but especially this great Lancastrian mm, properties mm, that were the most powerful in the Kingdom of England and that uh, the, the the confiscation of it basically and, and exile the same Henry in France would you know bring to uh, this this broader attrition and in fact uh, the the second revolt actually occurred against uh, Henry when he he was he had set forth for for Ireland once again and Henry came back from France because France actually at that time had um, was interested in in peace with England so this thing actually took really the character of an internal English uh, problem. So today we we essentially look at the the, tri the king triumphant and this, this broader problem of historical interpretation. Also, what actually did go wrong? Because uh, one thing is, uh, you know, some people believed also he was you know mentally ill. Uh, he might have had some kind of disorder, but let's say certain political actions we can't judge at 
you know, 600 years of distance, what could be in the mind of an English king uh, at the time. But um, surely there are certain, you know, uh, mistakes that that have been read also in a psychologistic sense uh, because of the uh, perdurance of the the, the affront, let's say, of, of the memory of the affront that had been uh, caused to him in, uh, in during the first crisis, that was nurtured, you know, for the, the pain of the hater, which was nurtured for eight years at the point of uh, making assume to to Richard this increasing authoritarian uh, positions, at the point of maybe even miscalculating the you know the internal balance of of the kingdom. Um, so naturally, the the figure is complex. Um, re that's the reason why we're splitting uh, the history of his reign a bit like this. But I think it's worth uh, the the interest in this regard. So you can say that until the summer of 1397, um, Richard had managed to strengthen the crown without provoking much dissent. Mm -hmm. Always remember, in England as we have explained also many times, uh, was, you know, very well uh, shaped from a political and institutional uh, point of view at the time. Surely there was this important uh, counterbalance of, of the parliament to English, uh, uh, to, 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 you know, to, to monarchic power. And um, at the time, you know, during the first crisis, the parliament specifically had essentially committed itself to control, for example, the use of, of monarchic finances. So it was a great uh, affront to the same uh, royal authority that for medieval standards, doesn't matter, you know, if the English ones were m more regulated in this way, but it, it was a big deal, right? And but objectively, at the end of these eight years, the, mm, I mean, Richard's creation had been solid after all, right? The scent existed, but he had a firm power up to this point. Um, with the help of Sir John Bushy, he had th that he had elected for speaker for the Commons in the January Parliament of 1397, and again in September, Richard had been able to choke off the Commons criticism, right, of his household and expenditure that had, as we've seen, had been the, the deal uh, before. Um, Richard is also a fascinating figure because, uh, you know unlike his warlike ancestors that surely had reasons not not just by temper I would say at all to to wage war but you know he he's important in general because he resumed as we've seen this um, Pacific policy with France it, it, and in fact in this period he had achieved the truce mm -hmm. Uh, there had been uh, naturally other, you know, expeditions in the continent. There had been one with 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 Scotland, at the same time, uh, which uh, you know, at the beginning of that period, he had also failed um, in, in practice. He, they invaded Scotland. It was not even a major battle, and you know, the, the English had to simply come back. And um, in at this point, naturally, a, a peace with France also means. Uh, naturally less expenses internally, but also less capacity, as also the War of the Roses would, would prove, for the English nobility to essentially have a, a bulb to, of venting their own political ambitions, right? Because they, they simply went, you know, out there uh, raiding, pillaging other, another country at the end of the day. Um, and the great, you know, there was an increasing hostility from the side, especially the Duke of Gloucester, um, and um, at this point, uh, you see, the, the, the main opposition against Richard had been brought by this group of noblemen uh, known as the Appellants, right? That, in fact, had appealed against, you know, the, mm, Richard's uh, policy, etc. Um, and by this time, uh, the king had managed, actually, to recruit most of the Appellants' retainers into the royal retinue. So, by the, the previous, mm, yeah, yeah, I mean, by actually the, the, mm, at the end of the first crisis. Mm. And uh, this was important because naturally had taken, stripped of most of this man also of important nets, uh, etc. Um, also, he had appointed naturally uh, an aristocracy of his own choosing mm, that surrounded him. 
Um, and still, this is what, you know, we say why being so harsh at that point. Uh, he um, was, you know, at least we don't know how concrete his security was at the time. We don't know. And we, we may have misjudged him popularly in, in that regard. But he decided to make a further strike against the appellants, and specifically Gloucester, Arundel, and Warwick. We were arrested, and uh, in the Parliament of September 1397, um, the latter two were uh, appealed of treason and condemned. Arundel was executed in London, wh while Warwick was sentenced to life imprisonment. Gloucester was al actually also of royal blood, so it couldn't be taken out so easily, in spite of was the, the head of, of, of the appellants in this regard, was bundled out of England, um, and he died in Calais, uh, in, let's say, not better, no, not specified circumstances, was probably murdered uh, by, um, you know, on Richard's orders, but still, you know, in, in a way that would be away from, from the English eyes, because uh, also the, the, gen the opinion of various classes w was, was important, right, that first, uh, you know, for example, think about uh, the, the revolt that occurred uh, in the 80s with what Tyler, John Bolt, that there, there was uh, surely ridden by the ability, which in the past, in fact, had also backed so, so these movements um, during the first crisis, before also with the, you know, talking about John, what Tyler John Bowles were, were, were saying uh, before, um, the, the, the kingdom was suffering as most European ones at this point because of the uh, consequences of the Black Death and uh, the, the broader strains brought by, by war, that surely uh, you know, the, the English, as you know, had um, achieved astonishing uh, victories at this point. This was a moment of stasis in a way, um, but surely had, did cost in the populace. So, you know, these were, you know, pretty industrial equilibrated systems that, you know, just for a moderate shift, you know, resources could, could suffer importantly. Um, and they wouldn't accept this, you know, ruthless um, policy of taking out the major uh, this quite important figures of the same uh, of the same royal blood as we've seen in case of Gloucester, and um, the, um, the, the the considered that at Calais uh, the, the the man in charge there was Thomas Mowbray, Earl of Nottingham, who had been uh, actually ousted by the appellants. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, you know, also had passed to, 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 to Richard and was operating on his behalf in the air. So, yeah. um, so it's been suggested, historiographically speaking, that Richard was acting simply out of revenge, of uh, re vengeance feelings, and uh, punishing these men for the humiliations he had suffered a uh, decade at their hands a decade er earlier. Um, the, the there is a letter written by Richard to Manuel Palaiologos in 1398, uh, referring indeed to the traitorous uh, noblemen who, you know, had attacked um, the royal rights and uh, prerogative when he was still young, uh, and so mm, that is an important aspect of it. Um, but it, it's difficult to assess whether this was his mm, unique reason of fear if objectively the situation was being, was, was let's say, unstable for other reasons. Because for some historians, the, this consolidation of power was instead something just tra transitory, hadn't been fully really consolidated, and uh, maybe there were schemes that were happening. Uh, at this point, there is uh, the author of uh, this force that, that is the uh, Trezon, um that writes um, that there was actually a plot against Richard occurring in summer 1397. And telling you the truth, even though there is no other evidence for, for this plot, 
it's still plausible, right? Uh, that might have existed. Uh, we we just we really just don't know. Um, and um, and we have even uh, an important hint that is that the same Gloucester's brothers, the the Dukes of Lancaster and York, actually concurred in the king's action. Uh, and uh, this speaks at least of the fact that you know Gloucester's loyalty was not this the solid to Richard. Uh, so. Um, the, the 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 king exploited this important achievement because he, he basically took out all the, his major um, political opponents now uh, to um, to enact sort of triumph hmm, uh, in the same parliament. Uh, Edmund Stafford, Bishop of Exeter and, and Chancellor, uh, preached uh, on on the duties of of obedience. Um, and uh, there was an act established uh, with the, the Council of 1386 that uh, was repealed uh, as were the pardons to the, the appellants. Um, Archbishop Arundel was impeached by the Commons for his parts in the events 1387-88 back in the day uh, and was deprived of his office and exiled. Mm, and when the Parliament assembled again in January at Shrewsbury. The acts of the so-called merciless Parliament, so the one of, of September 1397, uh, were uh, were repealed. So, in um, in an attempt to secure the permanence of these new acts, it was decided that the main hairs of the condemned appellants um, should should have been ta basically taken out of Parliament uh, and the Council as well. Uh, this is fascinating because mm, from one hand you know you would understand it Richard wanted to take out any um, you know any figure that could perpetuate the cause of the opponents in, in that sense but the problem is that the the lens of the uh, of their Pair of their their fathers had already been uh, confiscated, right? So the the actual power that these people held, as long as that land had remained into royal uh, hands uh, or the one of of of, uh, of Richard's um, new aristocratic su supporters, uh, you know, would have not posed such a great threat to to the crown in that sense. Um, the these new titles and lands were distributed to these um, to what um, Walsingham uh, was uh, Richard's opponent uh, called as the Ducati essentially so the small dukes um, and uh, so mm, in in this regard the you know the move was enough would have been enough mm -hmm. uh, also all those present in the autumn parliament swore on St. Edward's Shrine, Westminster, to uh, maintain all the acts uh, of, of that parliament in perpetuity. And also on the final, final day of the uh, Shrewsbury parliament, a committee was set up to deal with um, any, you know, questions of no matter really um, so that you know the the main the, the greater part of of uh, of Richard's opponents have been literally destroyed right uh, the he he had been married to Charles the sixth of France um, daughter Isabel um, that had uh, provided him with an important dowry uh, and the customs, so important sources of revenue, and uh, therefore the king uh, of England would have, you know, well thought that it was it was done right. Uh, in after eight years, all the major perpetrators of the first movement had been taken out, mm -hmm. and that also he could dispense of the parliament as well because you know with with all that income, fundamentally would have not been also 
necessary or in the moment of which war was not on, uh, on the side, at least you know, with France, uh, that had the interest to maintain that peace at that moment, um, would have been you know easy. It was it was done. The the, the 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 stability would have been secure. So these last two parliamentary sessions in 1397 and 98 um, represent. Um, remarkable working out of the principles um, against uh, traitors formulated in the judges answers of 1387 mm -hmm. and uh, they they had brought in fact to, to the lawful the elimination of the king's opponents mm -hmm. and finally Richard controlled this point everything in uh, you know the, the lords and commons acted fundamentally in obedience to his will. Uh, this um, this is not so difficult to, to understand, right? Richard had basically deprived the lords of, of their leadership mm -hmm. and provided his own ringleaders. While 42% of the commons were newcomers that and the king had ensured that the speaker uh, would be his servant as well, Sir John Bush, right? So the situation had been controlled, uh, you know, masterful, I would say. And the king um, had been fully successful, realized how the parliament could be, you know, c controlled. That's pretty, pretty much it. So the, there was also at this point the enforcement of uh, oath uh, policy, let's say, um, to to water community, including the mayors, the bailiffs, the sheriffs, the clerics, and the bishops, that were all required to swear to uphold the acts of these two parliamentary sessions as well. Uh, so it was like um, a, a very you know plenary, let's say, uh, political move here, that where everybody was brought to fulfill the king's will through the parliament, of course, and uh, the uh, uh, approval. And men also were persuaded to purchase, let's say, their own ca charters of, of pardon, which naturally, as you understand, is not really a way to secure, you know, uh, a concrete security in that sense. So that's, that was also a mean of saying, you know, you have you know, something to that you had to, uh, to be forgiven for, so you paid for it, yes, but I don't really believe you you truly uh, you you're truly innocent in that regard and th there was definitely an atmosphere of, of suspicion um, and um, some characters felt particularly threatened at this point one was Henry Bolingbroke mm -hmm. Duke of Hereford the, the future Henry uh, the fourth uh, that was the the son of um, of, of the of Gant uh, that um, had been, as we've seen, largely, um, you know, a, a, an influent figure, but had never been in, in full opposition against Richard. Um, and he was the legitimate heir, uh, also, therefore, his grandfather was Edward III. Um, he, he had shortly uh, received, actually, the dukedom, dukedom of Hereford. The other figure was Thomas Mowbray, uh, that had been made is that Duke of Norfolk. Um, they had both been appellants themselves back in 1387, 1388, and Mowbray was uh, the least powerful, uh, in this sense also the, the, the less secure, as events would prove, because the, the two also quarreled when the, um, for as we'll see for, for this, um, you know, this alleged uh, accusations of plotting against the king. Um, Henry instead was protected by this enormous Lancastrian estate and also the prestige deriving from his father's position. Um, Norfolk um, was, uh, had also participated uh, in some way in the death of the Duke of Gloucester himself, so it being pawns of St. Richard uh, at this point. Uh, understandably, given the situation, um, and um, the, the 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 thing followed like this. I mean, Mowbray 
said to have attempted to draw Bolingbroke in, into a uh, plot against Richard. Um, and um, and it, it was the same Duke of Hereford, in fact, that revealed Mowbray's concerns to the king. Now, this is interesting because Richard took it as they, they were both plotting uh, against him. So, this is, I don't know, it's possibly even likely, even here. We, we have no proof that the king was just paranoid. I mean, objectively, at those levels, those political levels, such things happen. Maybe, I don't know, uh, you know, Henry was completely uh, innocent in that regard. But surely the interests and the situation and the, the possible political options were, were, you know, on, on the table for the two. Um, so th there was a parliamentary uh, committee was held um, in, um, in uh, to, to essentially solve the problem because uh, Henry had basically accused uh, Mowbray. So th the question was uh, at the beginning it was asked to, 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 sol to be solved by trial by, by, by battle. Mm -hmm. And the um, instead uh, later on um, the the king denied this possibility. We understand that Mowbray was, let's say, more unstable in many ways. He was also a great talker in that regard, and he um, he he would have been better uh, exiled. Uh, Bolingbroke. Uh, two, right? You know, at this point, also his wife Mary Bohan had died, um, and um, he he was exiled as well, um, and uh, that would have deprived the king of an important threat because, um, as as we've seen, mm, he he had owned this major estates up to that point. So at this point, they were confiscated. Uh, the same Duke of Lancaster basically had agreed to the sentence of exile here. Um, and um, so even in here it seems as if Richard had fundamentally gotten rid of another important problem. But uh, surely even in a sense of political temperature, th this doesn't seem like a quite uh, easy situation. Um, he, um, you know, mm, he, he was pressing on too many parts of English society, um, too many important figures, right, and this was creating discontent, but he may have also had his valid reasons after all. Um, still everything seemed secure, right, there were new oaths uh, elicited from Richard's subjects um, that now even included a promise to uphold the judgments and ordinances made it uh, commentary where the in fact Richard was very concerned for maintaining the parliamentary acts of 1397 1398 and the judgments at commentary um, so much that later on in uh, his will drawn up in April 1399 which naturally things had gone you know differently at this point um, he wrote that the um, residual um, uh, royal treasure that was still, you know, considerable at the time, was to pass to his successor only if this had firmly observed and ratified the acts and judgments, mm -hmm. which is very meaningful because here, as we were saying, we can't be in the hand of an English king so easily. But you have to realize here that this was felt as a m as a way to to secure still the throne and that's where historiography has come up mostly saying you know but this may have uh, actually been a you know a sign of that, that Richard was out becoming out of, out of touch because telling the truth these fates uh, excuse me these oaths were mm, often unwillingly given right so uh, even if you know the real you know let's say the political reality is something different and it doesn't matter how binding they were because naturally at the time an oath was definitely more important than today but uh, and especially you know from a political and institutional as well as religious point of view th this was a big deal at the time but of course we know how politics was was actually 
carried out and how things actually ended for the same uh, for the same Richard. So, n however, we can that in here historiography has seen mostly the insistence on these measures as a sort of um, you can say obsession, but that definitely something that was what he had insisted so much of the role this time, which he had even at least struggled to to resume that. Uh, I mean to acquire uh, a power as the one had been, uh, you know, reduced sensibly in the first in, during the first crisis. This is this is very important to understand also the figure. Mm -hmm. Other aspect, but this we will see in another time, is that he uh, that that led to you know kind of uh, questions historiographically speaking in why. Um, this, mm, you know, he's moved to mm, w wage another uh, Irish campaign that was in fact exploited, as we will see next time, from, uh, you know, by, by Henry to to land in England and gather forces again. And actually an important part that we missed here is that um, the, the banishment, uh, not quite the exact, you know, I had not contemplated yet um, the uh, confiscation of the Lancastrian estates at this point, because for that Richard actually waited for um, uh, John of Gaunt's uh, death that occurred on February the third, thirteen ninety nine, and at that point he can uh, he confiscated the Lancastrian possessions, also prolonging the uh, the time of the uh, of the ban for for Henry. Um, this is important because at at the time, uh, in spite of the, the king's power, the the, the measure was seen still seen as you know uh, illegal in, in in many ways, and and that is understandable. So it, it's something that makes us look m more at the you know the the need of security that Richard was was seeking. Uh, 